Discord and mute everybody. Good evening, folks, and welcome to another in our series on the Gospel of Luke uh, tonight and next week, and we'll finish chapter two. It's breakneck speed that uh, that we are achieving with the Gospel of Luke. Um, hopefully you're getting something out of the study. I'm getting an awful lot out of it because I'm the one doing all the study and preparation for it. I'd like to begin this evening by reading Psalm 57. And when I look in my Bible, it confuses me. Because whenever I read a psalm before a class, I always write the date above the psalm, and there were no dates above this one, and I know I've read this one before, classes before, because of the, uh, the phrase in it, I will awaken the dawn, but I don't know, maybe it's another Bible. Anyway, Psalm 57, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to the God Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be all over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Apropos for what we are going to be discussing this evening as we continue our discussion of uh, Mary and Joseph's encounter with Simeon and uh, get to Anna this evening as well. Um, and then, as I said, next week we'll finish out chapter two and do a because I expect that section to be go a little faster, we'll do a recap of Luke 1 and 2, which is the first major division within uh, Luke's gospel. But last week, we were looking at uh, Joseph and Mary bringing Jesus to the temple to do what the law required for, uh, for him and for Mary, who needed to be purified. And as they enter, they encounter Simeon, uh, a devout man who's been told that he is going to see the Lord's Messiah before he dies. When he sees Jesus, Simeon takes the babe from Mary and then bursts into this enthusiastic hymn of praise because God's promise to him has been fulfilled. He's seen the Lord's Christ. Uh, and his, his hymn of praise comprised of three pairs of lines and verses 29 to 32. Last week we looked at verses 29 to 31 and stopped short there because verse 32 is so jam-packed with uh, imagery that I wanted to go through it a little bit more slowly and we were already going slowly enough as, as it was. Simeon rejoices to begin with in verse 29 because his purpose has been fulfilled and now God his promise has been fulfilled to him, and now he surrenders himself over to God and says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. In other words, if this is my time, so be it. You promised me that I would not die until I had seen the Messiah, and if I've seen him, and if this is not, if my time is now, then take me, Lord, I'm ready because my life has reached its full. I've seen your Christ. He speaks of his eyes seeing the salvation that, uh, that God has revealed for all mankind. And then he gets into verse 32 where he says, 
that this salvation that God has prepared is a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory to your people, Israel. Light and salvation are frequently paired within Scripture. We're going to be, again, back in Isaiah this evening, but only for the first part of class, uh, where Isaiah uses the imagery an awful lot, too in comparing salvation to God's revelation or God's revealing light, his illuminating light. Um, in Acts chapter 13, verse 47, the same imagery is, is uh, used, quoting from Isaiah, speaking of Israel, for the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that I may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Light and salvation, again, paired and the same in Acts chapter 26. I think it's interesting when you get into Paul's letter to Colossians, he doesn't use the phrase light. But he does speak in the same imagery in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. For he, is, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He's taking the one side of the coin, the darkness, and saying God took us out of the darkness and took us to something else. Light is implied in the rescue from the domain of darkness. We've come out of darkness, the opposite of it being light. We have come into light. We have seen light from, because God has revealed himself and God's salvation is revealed as light. In Isaiah chapter 49, in verse 6, which was the quote from Acts chapter 13, he says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. God is speaking to Israel, who is going, Israel the nation, is going to go off into captivity into Babylon. And someday God is going to bring Israel back. But he's saying to Israel, I'm not going to reestablish you just as Israel, just as the kingdom of Israel, here autonomous to yourself and isolated to yourself. That's too small a thing for you. I'm going to make you a light to the nations that the whole earth can see and be amazed. Because of all the nations that Assyria scattered, of all the nations that Babylon dragged off to Babylonia, when the decree of Cyrus went out saying that all peoples can return back to their homelands, one nation returns. That nation is Israel. God rebuilds, resurrects from the dead, if you will, the nation of Israel and reestablishes them and builds them back up to the point that they are going to bring forth God's Messiah, to bring forth the Christ of God that uh, Simeon now holds in his in his arms as he's praising God. This dawning light for the Gentiles arises from a couple of verses here in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. If you have a Bible, turn there, because we're going to... And you're going to want to keep a finger there, because we'll be referring back to it in just another minute or two. Isaiah 60, <clears throat> verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to, your bright, to the brightness of your rising. I think of Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, where Jesus says, you are the light of the earth, or you are the light of the world. The city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do people light a lamp and stick it under a bushel, but rather it gives, set it up on the stand where it gives light to the whole house. Eyes are drawn to light. If we're sitting in darkness, our eyes are naturally drawn to a light source. Uh, if you're trying to sleep at night and somebody turns on a light somewhere in the house and you wake up, your eyes go there because our eyes are pulled toward are pulled toward the light. The glory of the Lord rising upon you reminds me of what Zechariah says when he's prophesying over John, uh, saying that the 
in verse 76 of chapter 1. In God's visitation, he says, You, child, will be called prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death. God's salvation coming with the imagery of light. People who are sitting in darkness, sitting in the darkness of their own sin, and this darkness, we're told in First Corinthians chapter two, Second uh, Corinthians chapter four. Wow, this darkness that covers the land is where God is rescuing us from, where He's calling us from. In Second Corinthians chapter four, and verse six, for God said, "Let light shine out of the darkness." For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of Christ in the face of Jesus Christ. And the image that we get from Isaiah chapter 63 is that the light of the, light of the Lord is rising upon Israel. And this light, the glory is going to be seen in Israel so much so that the nations are going to take notice and are going to be drawn to this light. Kings are going to kings are going to come into the brightness of your rising, not riding. Israel is not riding ponies. They are rising as God brings them back to the land. They are rising from the ashes of the ruins of Israel. Um, and God says, kings are going to be drawn to this. Kings, you're going to be so brilliant. The light is going to shine so brightly that people are going to take notice. There's an obvious application to that um, that we will discuss when we get a little further into this. Uh, one verse that I wanted to pull out of this, it might be in a... Uh, it might be in a future slide, but it's uh, John chapter 12. <clears throat> and verse something or other. Now, John chapter 12, verse 44. Whoever believes in me believes not in him believes not in me, but him who sent me. Whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Jesus says, I've come into the world as light. Elsewhere, he says that he is the light of the world. He's come as light to illuminate, to give illumination to those who are sitting in darkness, that they might see, that they might be drawn to that light, drawn out of the darkness and come toward the light. Kings and nations are going to come toward Israel as they're restored. Simeon holding the uh, child Jesus in his arms says, this light is a revelation not to Israel, but for the Gentiles, those who are on the periphery. And we're going to see a lot of that in Luke's gospel. Jesus ministering to those who are on the outskirts, who are on the fringes. Jesus isn't focusing his ministry on the, the center of Judaism. He's not focusing it on the elite. He's not going to the Pharisees, the scribes, or the teachers of the law, but rather he's going to those who those people have pushed to the sides and you know, sweep them out of the temple. Let's keep the temple a nice, neat, tidy place. We don't want these undesirables here. Jesus goes to the undesirables, and further he goes to the Gentiles. Uh, and this light of revelation is going to be for the Gentiles. They're going to see. And later on in Luke's writings in, in the book of Acts, we see the gospel. We see the light of the gospel coming to the Samaritans. We see the light of the gospel coming to the Gentiles and beyond to, to all the nations to all flesh, as Paul says. The salvation that he's holding is also going to be for glory to your people, Israel. There are... Paul in, argues, especially in the book of Romans, he argues that there is a lot of value in being a Jew, a Jew and a Christian. 
coming out of Judaism into Christianity because the Jews had the heritage, they had the prophets, they had the, the, the patriarchs, they had the law. Jesus is the crowning glory of the nation of Israel. He is the culmination of their purpose as a nation. They were to bring forth the Messiah upon the earth. Israel's hope in Isaiah chapter 6 was that with the coming of the light of salvation, the attention of all people would be drawn to Israel. With the coming of the Messiah, everyone would stop and look and be awed by what they see in Jesus. They're going to be awed by what they see coming out of Israel, this light, this bright shining light of salvation, illuminating the darkness of their day-to-day -day lives. At the heart of what makes Israel special is that salvation comes through the Jews. Paul says as much in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 5, and Jesus, with the woman at the well in Samaria, tells her directly that salvation comes through the Jews because she's, she's talking about the, the well there and saying, you Jews say you worship in, you're supposed to worship in, in Jerusalem at the temple and well, we've always worshiped here on this hill. And Jesus says, we worship what we know. You worship what you don't know. Salvation comes from the Jews, but a time is coming Jesus tells her, a time is coming when neither in Jerusalem nor on this hill, he's speaking of the, the, the spreading of the gospel, the spreading of that light to all the nations, to encompass and enfold all people. Um, one of the things about, about the imagery of light is that it engulfs us. The light of God's salvation is not some weak flickering candle in pitch darkness, but rather it's this glorious shining light. We are engulfed in salvation. We can't be just a little bit saved. That's like saying that a woman's just a little bit pregnant. Either you are or you aren't. You are either saved or you're not. You are engulfed in the light of the gospel. You are engulfed in salvation. God doesn't save just, you know, your right hand or your, or your left foot. God saves you in total, the totality of your being. God enwraps you in his light, bringing you into uh, salvation. So the Jews have, the Jews have this wonderful blessing on them in that they're the, they're the nation that brings forth God's Christ. They're the nation that brings forth the Messiah. If any people should embrace Jesus, it's the Jews. We know they're not going to. Simeon's going to allude to that uh, here in just a couple of minutes. I want to reread the verses that we did not uh, cover last week. I'm going to start in verse 33 down to verse 40 of Luke chapter 2. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak to, of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now imagine being the parents of Jesus and hearing all these things being said about your child. You've heard the testimony of the shepherds who come bursting into the, the place where you're staying, and they find your child asleep in a manger and, and start exclaiming to you about angels. Angels who are praising God, saying that a savior had been born and that we would find him wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Angels told us this. Well, okay, Mary's 
seen an angel. She talked to Gabriel. Joseph has at least seen an angel in a dream, um, getting instruction from the angel to take Mary as his wife. But still, it's not an everyday occurrence. It's not like there's an angel hanging around in every street corner that you can just walk up to and talk, talk to. And then Simeon saying these strange things, this, this effusive praise of God over your child that he's taken from you. And then Anna, who's going to speak later, it, it has to be somewhat overwhelming, I would think, because this is their baby. This is, this is Mary's child. Uh, but like all other people, they're going to have to come to know Jesus through his life, through his teaching, through his ministry, because he's not a son like any other son. He is a very special son. He's a different son, being the son of God. And it's interesting that Simeon doesn't bless Jesus. Instead, he blesses the parents. And it may go, I, I was thinking about this last night when Carrie was uh, teaching the life of Abraham and, and pointing out how the text is stressing that the greater blesses the lesser. Simeon probably doesn't bless Jesus because he recognizes that Jesus is the son of the most high and instead turns to the parents and blesses them, giving Mary a rather uh, severe mercy speaking to them saying that this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. So is this a reference to one group of people or two groups of people? Is it believers who suffer and are then vindicated or believers who humble themselves falling before God in their, in, in humility to be raised up by him? There's two ways you could look at that. Or is it, Two groups of people, unbelievers who are going to confront Jesus in their unbelief and fall because of their unbelief, and believers who are going to recognize in Jesus what they've been searching for, the redemption of Jerusalem, the consolation of Israel, the, sa the, sa the saving of their own souls. Uh, there's some verses that could kind of support the first view. Micah chapter seven verse eight. Part of it says, uh, "When I though I sit and when I sit in darkness, when I fall, I shall rise. Uh, though I sit in darkness, I shall uh, rise up again." Proverbs chapter twenty four verse sixteen, which is a verse I have taped to one of my monitors at my office, uh, it says that the righteous falls seven times and rises again, um, which I find encouraging if I try something and fail. The verse there is saying, the righteous don't give up. The righteous get back up and keep going. Um, I don't know if you ever get frustrated with your own sinfulness and the, the sin that you fall into, where you go back to God praying, I can't believe I did this again. Please, Lord, find it in your heart to forgive me. And I really like, I really appreciated Don's sermon yesterday, uh, looking in the mirror and seeing the, the faults, seeing the flaws, and then recognizing that God sees differently. We're our own harshest critics. We're our own harshest judges. And it's very easy, especially for me, it's very easy for me to beat myself up when I fall. And feel almost too ashamed to go back to God and say, look, I, I blew it again. Um, but God extends forgiveness and reminds me again how much I need his grace and how great his love is. Luke chapter uh, 1, verse 52, in the Magnificat, Mary speaks of the humbled, those who are of humble estate being exalted by God. As much as I like those verses, I don't think that Simeon is speaking of one group of people. I think rather he's speaking of the second view, uh, that there are two groups of people, and we're going to see them over and over and over again in the Gospel of Luke, that there is going to be um, division. A consistent fact about Jesus' ministry is that it divides people into two groups, people who are going to reject and oppose Jesus. They're going to reject what he says, and they're going to oppose him. And then there are going to be those who accept what he says 
and embrace him and believe and follow after him and want to know more about him to the point that they'll be willing come day of Pentecost to give themselves over and say, Jesus is Lord of my life and to be baptized and walk from that day forward as best they're able in the light that, that God provides, uh, John chapter one, uh, first John chapter one, verse seven. I think of all the verses that are, that are here, um, I can send you the slides, Bill, if you haven't got them all copied down. <laughs> the one that's the most telling, I think, is Luke, is Luke chapter 12, verses 51 to 53, where he says, do you think that I've come to give peace on earth? I have not come, no, rather, no, I tell you, but rather division. Uh, for, I should say, from, for from no, from now on, oh my, I didn't proofread these slides, can you tell? Usually I, I run through them dry once before class to make sure I didn't misspell. From now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. And he continues in the uh, verse 53 saying that a, a son will be divided against his father and a father against his son, a mother against her daughter, a daughter against her mother, a mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and so on. Jesus says, I've come to bring division. In fact, Simeon says of him that he's destined in the New International Version or the English Standard Version. He is appointed to be an occasion for division. Um, Romans chapter 9 and verse 33, wonderful chapter where Paul's talking about the sovereignty of God. But he says in verse 33, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And the same thing is mentioned in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. A quotation of a prophecy that is given to King Ahaz by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 8. The same theme is coming out in um, Simeon's prophecy over Jesus. For Ahaz, there's division coming. God is going to separate Israel into the righteous and the unrighteous. He's going to save the righteous by sending them to Babylon. And the unrighteous, he's going to consume in the destruction of Jerusalem 150-ish years after Isaiah receives this vision. There is going to be division in God's people or among God's people. In John chapter three, Jesus speaks in verse 19 saying, and this is the judgment, the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. I think it's interesting, um, the word there, judgment, in verse 19, I think the New International Version says has the word verdict. This is the verdict or this is the judgment. The Greek word is crisis. Um, and it's spelled like it sounds and it's from which we get the English word crisis. It is a verdict handed down or is a judgment handed down. This is the decision that's been handed down. The people that like darkness hide in the darkness because they're ashamed to bring their, their works into the light. The people who love light welcome it uh, so that their work can be seen for what it is uh, being done in God. The Son of the Most High, Jesus, is like the cloud of the divine presence in Exodus chapter 14. You remember when Moses and the Israelites have left Egypt and they've sort of wandered kind of aimlessly to the edge of the Red Sea. And they're there against the Red Sea. And here comes Pharaoh and his army and his chariots coming toward them. And the people are crying out in fear. And Moses is telling God, what are we going to do? And, Mo and God says, stretch your staff out across the, the sea and it'll be divided. And while that's going on, the, the cloud that God is in moves to the other side of Israel and interposes himself between Israel and Egypt. And the text says that the, the one side could not come to the other. Through all that night, as the sea is being divided, the one side can't come to the other. 
Jesus is that way. Jesus brings light to one side or darkness to the other. In 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, verses 15 and 16, the gospel is compared to, or salvation is compared to a fragrance, the aroma of life or the aroma of death, or the aroma of life to those who are being saved, the aroma of death to those who are perishing. Uh, later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul speaks of the gospel being veiled to those who are perishing, but we who with unveiled faces behold God are being transformed uh, from one form of glory into the other. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul speaks of the gospel being folly to those who are fleshly, to those who are perishing. He says elsewhere in that chapter that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men, that the gospel message sounds like nonsense to the heart that will not receive it. When we preach the good news of salvation, that the, the we, we've all done deeds deserving of death, but the good news is that God sacrificed his son to pay for our sin. Some people scratch their heads and say, well, that makes no sense. That's, that's foolishness. And they turn away from that and other people tearfully embrace it with joy knowing that I, I don't have to carry this burden of guilt around anymore i can lay this down i can lay it at jesus feet and take up his yoke instead jesus is bringing light he's bringing division he's bringing uh, division within israel and he's also going to be a sign that is opposed it's no mystery as you study through the through the gospel that Jesus ran into opposition from time to time uh, during his ministry. Chapter four of Luke, uh, toward the end of chapter four, in, well, the middle part of the end, uh, in verse 28, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff, but passing through their midst, he went away. That's opposition. I, I've, I've encountered opposition to the gospel message, but never to the point that somebody was trying to drag me out of town to kill me. Um, Jesus is going to encounter this many times through his, uh, throughout his ministry. Some people are going to resist Jesus. To them, he's not the consolation of Israel, but a figure to be opposed. Other people are going to look at Jesus and say, this is what I've been looking for. This is what, what I need to hear. You remember the end of the Sermon on the Mount where the people were amazed at his teaching because he spoke like one with authority rather than the teachers of the law and the scribes and the Pharisees who kept reiterating the same old thing over and over again and preached a religion that was so starched and so cold and so devoid of mercy that you could look at it and feel despair because I'll never measure up. I'll never measure up to the righteous requirements of the Pharisees. Then Simeon says something interesting. In verse 35, the English Standard Version has it as a parenthetic statement, meaning it's got parentheses around it, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. And I do think this is an aside to Mary. I don't think it carries on being part of the rising and falling, though it's in that context. And so I think that context bears on its interpretation. While I was studying this, um, I found no fewer than 10 interpretations of what, the, what these words mean. And so I make this uh, statement here. The statement has caused much division among biblical scholars. The pun there is intended. Uh, we've been talking about Jesus bringing division. Well, this statement brings division among people. I'm going to present five of them to you. Uh, three of them are a little bit uh, off the wall-ish. And then two make an awful lot more sense. Uh, I 
will come down on the side of one of those two as, as we go through this discussion. Origen, who was a, a Bible scholar of sorts, around 200 AD, said that this sword that is going to pierce Mary's soul is a metaphor for doubt, that during the course of Jesus' ministry, Mary is going to come to doubt. She's going to doubt Jesus, and that doubt is going to be like a sword tearing her apart uh, from inside. I don't think that that's what's implied here, because we never see Mary doubting, really, within Luke's gospel, within Luke's gospel mind, okay? Bear, bear with me, because I'm going to circle back to that in just a minute. Uh, Epiphanius in around 350 AD said that this was a prophecy of Mary's martyrdom. There is no evidence anywhere in any writings that Mary was martyred. Nor is there any evidence, uh, this third idea, that Mary aligned with Jesus will also be rejected by the opponents of Jesus. There's no evidence that any of the opposition or hostility that was directed toward Jesus fell on Mary or the rest of her family um, outside of the persecution that the church will endure a little bit later on in the book of Acts, but not immediately from the Sanhedrin. Uh, do we find that Mary is being chased and harassed and harangued by the enemies of Jesus? So there's two ideas that have a little bit of merit to them. One is that the sword refers to the pain and sorrow of Mary seeing Jesus suffer and die. There's two problems with that. It's a very attractive um, interpretation because if you're a parent and you, you see your child in pain, you feel anxiety or you feel anguish over it. Um, I think there is a special relationship that exists between mothers and sons, um, as I think there's a special relationship that exists between fathers and daughters. If, if I were to go and visit the English household and, and, and walk in and smack Dion upside the head, Don might chuckle over that. I smack one of his daughters upside the head. Okay, there's going to be a problem. Um, I think that relationship exists with a purpose that God has designed between the father, between fathers and daughters. Which is not to say that fathers don't feel anything for their sons, that fathers don't feel compassion for their sons. But I think it's to a lesser degree than what they feel toward daughters. And I. I'm not a mother, I'm not a woman, I've never been a mother, um, but I'm going to say that that coin might be flipped to the other side from a mother's perspective, that a mother might feel a little bit more toward her sons than she does toward uh, her daughters. And, uh, Christy may be typing a correction into me now as, <laughs> as I'm speaking. Like I said, um, this is my opinion. After I finished the Gospel of Luke, uh, Don can teach the Gospel of Luke, a rebuttal. Um, you've got over a year to prepare for it, Don, so don't worry. There's two problems I see in this interpretation. Number one is that Luke does not mention Mary as present at the cross or during the Passion of Jesus. Now, we know she was there, right? The other Gospels tell us that she was there. But if you're sitting down to study a Gospel, you really need to put blinders on and focus first on the context of the gospel you're studying apart from what you know from the other gospels. Luke is writing specifically to Theophilus to instruct Theophilus and encourage him that the things that he has heard are true. He doesn't mention Mary as present at the cross. And another, pro another problem is that the context of what Simeon is saying has to do with division rather than the suffering that Christ is going to undergo. We know from Luke that Jesus is going to undergo suffering. We know from the other Gospels that Mary was at the cross. I don't think that this is as strong an um, interpretation of what the sword piercing Mary's soul is as 
having the pain of the of Jesus as he that is caused by Jesus to marry as he creates his own family of disciples and he sets his own priorities. I think this view would be a little bit stronger if the note of familial descent and questioning was present in Mark chapter 3 verses 31 to 35 was present in Luke. It isn't. Or if the reference to Jesus bringing a sword was present in Luke, but it isn't. It's only present there in Matthew. I think there's a little more weight on this side, primarily from this verse here in chapter 2 uh, that we're going to be studying next week, uh, verses 48 to uh, 50 of Luke chapter 2, where it says, when his parents saw him, this is after they've been searching in Jerusalem for three days for Jesus, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? For behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And that's a strong word. They've been beside themselves with distress because their son is gone. He's disappeared. And Jesus responds saying, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. Stop right there. They didn't understand. And so here's the first chink in the armor, if you will. Here's the first driving in of that sword to, there, there's going to be division that comes up. Some of the decisions that Jesus makes and some of the things that he does in his ministry are going to be very hard for Mary to understand and are going to be very difficult for her to witness. And I think that his suffering as dying on the cross is part of that. But she's going to have to come to terms with, way before he gets there, she's going to have to come to terms with some of the things that he is teaching. Because he teaches not what the Jewish leaders and the religious experts are teaching. He's teaching something radical. He's teaching something different. I want to take a moment and read uh, what Christy wrote, taking gender completely out of it, it would tear my soul to see any of my children suffer, especially to the extent of what Mary witnessed that Jesus went through. It would tear out my soul to see them suffer. And yes, it would. But if, I don't know how to put this, if, if one of them were the Messiah, if Jesus hadn't been born, if one of them were to be the Messiah, and he's going down this path that you don't understand and Mary is pondering on these things in her heart, I think that's going to cause some sleepless nights and some anxiety in itself. Seeing Jesus saying the things he's saying and doing the things he's doing. Um, I think that's more what Simeon is getting to. I think whatever the figure represents, I think it has more to do with division than it does with suffering. Um, the yeah, one of the notes I wrote sideways in my notebook, Jesus' ministry will bring choices that will be hard for Mary to bear. I think Mary is going to, because Mary sticks with Jesus throughout his ministry, and it's going to be a tough road to hoe for her, watching from the sidelines, so to speak, as Jesus carries out this ministry to uh all of, Ju all of Judea and, and the regions around Galilee. And yes, he's going to be rejected. And yes, he's going to suffer for it. But at the same time, he's going to teach some things that are radically different from what people have been hearing for years and years and years. The next step in, uh, and if you take this parenthetical statement out, out of it, um, from what Simeon says, the child is appointed for the rising and falling of many in Israel for a sign that is opposed so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. But this word that's used for uh, thoughts, uh, the Greek word uh, dialogismoi, is used 13 times in the New Testament and always refers to thoughts that have set themselves up in opposition to the will of God or, or, or resisting the will of God. It's used 13 times throughout uh, the New Testament. And it's interesting that during his ministry, 
Jesus knew the thoughts of those who opposed him. Frequently, it, we're, we have the references there, the ones that are in Luke, uh, chapter 5, 10, 6, 8, 11, 17, and 20, verse 23. But also in, like the account in Luke chapter 7, um, beginning in verse 36, when Jesus goes to the house of Simon the Pharisee, and a sinful woman in town hears that Jesus is there, brings an expensive flask of perfume, and stands behind Jesus weeping, and washes his feet with her tears, and wipes them with her hair, and breaks the um, the open the the flask of ointment, and anoints Jesus' feet. And the guests, it's in, it's not written there, but you you have to know they're aghast, stunned. What on earth is going on? This 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 woman, this sinful woman, is is doing this, and he's not doing anything about it. And all of their thoughts are expressed in the thought that Simeon has in verse thirty nine. Now, when the Pharisee who invited it saw this, he said to himself, "If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner." And then verse 40 says, and Jesus answering him said, Simeon didn't say anything out loud. He's thinking this. If he knew what sort of person this is, and Jesus answers him and says, Simeon, I have a question for you. And then he proceeds to teach Simeon a lesson on love and why the woman who loves much because she's forgiven much goes away forgiven and, and the guests there are just scandalized. Who is this who can, who can forgive sins? The thoughts are exposed. Um, how people respond to the promise of God is made evident in how they respond to Jesus, whose, whose presence reveals their true colors. Jesus comes and people have to choose. The gospel demands a response. It, it demands that Either you accept it or you reject it. Some of them oppose them and fall. Some of them receive them and are, and are lifted up. John writes in John chapter 1, verse 12, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And again, going back to Don's uh, sermon yesterday, that's an elevation from mere human being. I'm a child of God. Yes, I'm a child of my, of my biological parents, but God adopts me into his family and makes me his child. That's a status greater, a status higher. Enough of Simeon. We have, oh my goodness, is that really the time? 10 slides left. Fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. Luke tells us about Anna. Anna is a prophetess. Um, Oh, I forgot I put this slide in here. Jewish tradition mentions seven women as prophetesses. Sarah, Miriam, Deborah, Hannah, Abigail, Huldah, and Esther. Quiz time. How many of those women does the Old Testament name prophetess? I'll give you a couple of seconds. You can write down the names on a, on a post-it note if, if you want and, and see how well you score. If you want a hint, the Old Testament names five women as prophetesses. I'll let you pick and choose and hem and haw and, and uh, this is kind of fun. All right, you got your answers? Time's up. The Old Testament names Miriam as a prophetess in Exodus chapter 15, verse 2, Deborah as a prophetess in Judges chapter 4, verse 4, and Huldah as a prophetess in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 1, 14. I don't know why. It's 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 14, not verse 1. Uh, Josiah's people find the scroll of the book of the law and they bring it to Josiah and read it in his presence. He tears his clothes and tells them, go inquire of the prophetess uh, who's going to tell us. So those three and two others, Noadiah in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 14, who opposed Nehemiah, 
along with other prophets, and Isaiah's wife in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3. I think the reason Jewish prophets or Jewish tradition doesn't name those last two is one, because Noadiah was a false prophetess, and because Isaiah's wife is uh, not named. We don't know what her name is from the book of Isaiah, but the others that were on that list, I don't know where they get the idea that, that those women were prophetesses. Um, I think for like, for example, Hannah, when Hannah is praying to God and says, if you give me a son, I'll, I'll give him back to you. And then God gives her a son and she gives him to God and that they say, Oh, that look, that's a prophecy. No, that's a promise. That's a promise. It's not a prophecy. If, if I make a promise to Peter, Peter, the next time I see you, I'll give you five bucks. I'm not making a prophecy that the next time I see Peter, I'll give him $5. Instead, I'm saying, Peter, next time I see you, I'll give you five bucks. It's a, it's a promise. It's not a prophecy. Anyway, enough of that. Her age. Her age is difficult. The Greek is ambiguous. Uh, the English Standard Version, which I think is wrong, uh, says in verse 37, uh, well, let me, verse 36, she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. And there's a footnote there that says, or as a widow for 84 years, which I think is the better reading. Uh, it's a difficult reading, but it's a better reading. And uh, one of the commentaries I use, uh, the, the Greek Testament commentary on Luke, uh, the guy who wrote it is a phenomenal Greek scholar, and that's the view that he takes, and he backs it up with an awful lot of Greek technicalities that I don't understand. So assuming that she was married at the age of 14, widowed at 21, she would now be 105. And it's not unknown or unheard of for people to live to that advanced age in first century. It's not common, obviously, but um, it's coincidentally the age that Judith in the apocryphal book of Judith uh, was when she died. We're not meant to think, this should not say mean, we're not mean. We are not meant to think that she's at the temple 24-7, but rather that she's there daily in service to God. She can't be there 24-7 because there'd be no place for her to sleep. There's no, you know, there's no guest rooms for her to be sleeping in. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 5, Paul talks of widows who are widows indeed, who devote them, who rather than remarrying, devote themselves rather to the service of God. Um, and Judith was another one who did that, who devoted herself to the service of God after she was widowed at a young age as well. Anna is a prophetess who comes in at, the, at the, that very hour and sees Mary and sees Joseph, but unlike Simeon, she doesn't go up and take the baby and speak to Mary and Joseph. Rather, she turns to the people who are there, who are present, who are seeking the redemption of Jerusalem and begins to speak to them about Jesus. And I wonder if this hints at a remnant theme within Luke, that only a remnant of God's people are going to end up being saved. Um, it's, it's so common elsewhere in Scripture, and Luke has emphasized it already twice here in chapter 2, uh, once with Simeon in verse 25 and here in verse 38 with Anna, that there are those who are genuinely seeking, genuinely seeking for God's salvation to come, who are ready for it, for those who are ready to hear fulfillment has already come. There's people who are waiting, on pins and needles for God to move. And Anna comes up and says, look, this is it. Here's the Messiah. Here's the Lord's Christ. Here's the one. We, we don't know what she said, but if she's speaking to those who are seeking the redemption of Jerusalem, obviously she's saying something about Jesus being that, being the answer to that, being the fulfillment of that. Um, it's interesting. We have the three witnesses that Luke gives us here in chapter two, the shepherds representing the common people, Simeon representing the pious uh, among Jewish men, and Anna representing the pious among Jewish women, all speaking about Jesus in these glowing terms. And Mary and Joseph, who must just be scratching their heads, thinking, what, on, what, what in the world is going on here? 
I find it interesting that Luke goes on from there in verse 39 and says, when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, where earlier in verse 22, he had said, and when the time came for the purification according to the law of Moses, I see an elevation there. I see a step up because they went beyond what the law requires. Joseph wasn't required to be there present and be purified, except, as I said, that maybe he came in contact with the, um, with the bodily fluids from the birth process. They're going beyond what the law requires. The law doesn't require that they dedicate the child to the Lord. Hannah did that with Samuel. They're going beyond. And so I think they're, they're, they're doing more. They're showing that they are obedient more or in a greater in a greater uh, fashion. And Luke draws this bit to a close by saying, and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The hand of the Lord was with John the Baptist in chapter 1, verse 66. Here the favor of the Lord rests on Jesus or is with Jesus. One minute for application, which is good because I only have the one slide. Jesus brings division. We can't straddle the fence or hedge our bet when it comes to our response to him. It's either we're all in or we're all out. It's, it's an all or nothing uh, proposition. And so it makes me ask of myself, where am I within, you know, on the scale of one to a hundred percent, where am I with my commitment? There are days when it doesn't seem that the needle gets much beyond 50 or so. Um, then it goes back to what Don said. When you're looking in the mirror, it's easy to see the see the uh, tank is kind of empty, or see the see the failings and see the fallings. Jesus comes to bring salvation, and the people who embrace him embrace him fully. Uh, and I think that the challenge for us is to embrace him as fully as well. The man of flesh keeps wanting to pull us back down and say, hey, remember me, gratify me, gratify me, gratify me. And God is saying, no, pay attention to me. Follow me. Take up your cross. Come after me. And we're going to encounter that as we, um, as we get further into Luke's gospel. That's as far as we're going this evening. Next week, um, we're going to finish chapter two. I don't know how many this is. That will be less than 12. We had five on chapter one plus one introduction. So that'll be six classes in chapter two. We slowed down a bit. We'll, we'll probably speed up once we get into uh, the ministry of John the Baptist and, and, and beyond, he says, with confidence. Let me stop the recording.